there was what is being, I guess, what is technically describable as a mass shooting, although I want to get into the use of that term. Uh, there was apparently, or at least is being reported, a dispute between two sets of kids or, or uh, minors. Um, and I'm not sure what kinds of guns they had, but they started shooting at each other after a dispute. And that resulted in one lady being killed, 22 people being injured, several injured children. Several of those children were shot. I believe some of them were also injured in like the, the reaction getting trampled or something. And I can't help but think there is a symbolism to this that will ring out in history forever. There's just, it's just so the Super Bowl is and gun, gun violence coming together in this moment. I I have a sense you will downplay that. But in terms of how it will be looked at from forever on out. And um Nick Wright, who is someone I'm a fan of, although I've given him shit on Twitter. Probably so impolitely that that if if he or anybody on the show saw it, they they wouldn't think it was cool at all. He is uh, he taunts fan bases. He has a, a real hard on for taunting the Bills. Um, and what's interesting is I don't think he needs to perform this troll act to be engaging. He's a really engaging, fun broadcaster who takes on this kind of shitty dick, shitty dick. This <laughs> this like. He just is just the dick to people to, uh, and that's part of his shtick. Um, this monologue of his nearly brought me to tears. He was there, the whole crew, the whole first things first crew, Nick Wright, Chris Broussard, my favorite uh, broadcaster, by the way, Chris Broussard, Kevin Wilds. They were all there when it happened. They were covering it. And, and, you know, I got to say, man, I do feel bad for, for him and everybody else. Like just the, you're there to celebrate something, a shared moment of joy, and it devolves into this. But but I I have a lot of thoughts on how this is being reacted to. So we'll we'll play some of the the uh, monologue. So I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you guys about the times my family first saw me cry because there's a chance you guys are gonna see me cry for the first time. For Diora, my older daughter. It was December of 2012 in the lobby of her school when she was seven years old when I went to pick her up the day of Sandy Hook. And that day, of course, someone with a lightweight semi-automatic rifle shot around two dozen kids her age. And I saw her in that lobby and I immediately started sobbing. It was the first time she ever saw me cry. My youngest daughter, Deanna, who's been on this show, who you, everyone here knows really well, First time she ever saw me cry was March of 2022 in our kitchen when I opened up Twitter and saw what had happened at Robb Elementary. And someone with a lightweight semi-automatic rifle shot around two dozen people that were her age. And I and I sobbed. And she was concerned. She didn't know. I didn't. I, I just like it was so. And I'm not a big crier. Nothing against it. But I I sobbed. And yesterday. Shortly after, a few kids themselves with lightweight semi-automatic rifles shot around two dozen people. Uh, my wife saw me cry in a way I haven't. And it wasn't when uh, at the parade. It wasn't on the walk over. It was at the hotel. Once we had gotten to the safety of our room, we're at the elevator. And there was this little old lady who was on the phone fighting back tears wearing a chief shirt and she saw me and knew us knew the show and came over and gave me a hug and started crying mm. and i still didn't cry yet and then we talked and she said she was there with her kids and grandkids and her i believe she said 14 year old granddaughter mm. had to take the lead because she's been trained for this and the adults wow. hadn't. And I cried. And I cried because it's so god dog cruel what we've taken from this generation of kids that we all got. There, listen, yesterday, Wilds is right, we're lucky, but yesterday was also 
the single worst 10 seconds of my life. And it was not, it was not the, when we heard the gunshot and we're told to get down and it was not it, the tin that the part that is seared into my memory from a selfish perspective is the time between them telling us active shooter and me finding in the crowd ostensibly where the shooter was my wife my sister-in-law and her best friend because i you know th those that 10 seconds felt like it was five minutes mm -hmm. uh but that that is that is a such a different feeling than for these young kids who have now had to learn, drill, and experience what to do in a mass shooting situation before they lose their first tooth, yeah. before they have their first kiss. For those kids there yesterday, part of their childhood ended. And to your point, those are the kids that we consider lucky. Mm -hmm. The kids who didn't end up in hospital beds. And so I, I, I'm incredibly sad about this. And this is where I will pivot a bit. But I am furious. I'm furious because this is so clearly all our fault. And we have so clearly lost the plot so quickly. I understand now that at this point, talking about any type of regulations whatsoever on guns in America is verboten for some, but we, some of the strictest statewide gun regulations ever passed in this country were passed by Ronald Reagan. Right. And mm -hmm. the, the assault weapons ban in the 90s was supported by Ronald Reagan, who is a paragon, uh, you know what I mean, for many on the conservative side of the aisle. I, we say when it comes to this particular topic, we turn ourselves into morons. We say ludicrous things like, why have laws? People break them. Like we make these arguments of, well, if you pass a law, only criminals will break the law. As if, okay, well then make selling meth legal because only meth dealers will break it. We, 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 we trick ourselves into good guy with a gun. There were 800 good guys there yesterday. How many of them did we shake hands with before that we saw? There were uniformed police. There were, there, there, you couldn't have had more good guys prepared, ready. And in an instant, there's nothing they can do mm. until after the fact and mitigate the damage. And that's my home city. And the only thing that brings Kansas City together is the Chiefs. We are a divided city. We are a segregated city. We have, the Chiefs is the only thing that brings it together. And the moment is is shattered. Mm. Yeah. And the, the, the state of Missouri, as of October, was fighting at the Supreme Court to not allow local police to enforce federal gun laws. They were fighting against the local cops' ability to enforce federal gun laws. That's how insane we've gone and what we will do is to just keep plowing ahead we will continue with the wellness checks that my best friend in the world called me yesterday to check on me just like i did for him two years ago when he was at a parade in highland park chicago that got shot up on the fourth of july and we'll just keep going with active shooter drills and a generation of kids who had this part of their life stolen from them and throw our hands up and say, what can we do when we all know the answer? And so okay. I, 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 you mind if I, uh, ask a question first? Not at all. This is your show, dude. No, not at all. What's the answer? Well, if you'll allow me, I think what's the question? Are we is is Nick Wright and so much of the sports media industrial complex asking the right questions here? Uh, full disclosure, I am 
I've come around on guns. I'm now essentially pro gun where I wasn't before, where I was much more vehemently on the side of gun regulations and could not understand the pro gun position and could not fathom why this conversation was so uh, irreconcilable. Such you always come to such an impasse. However, I am for sensible regulations. I don't, I don't quite understand the like absolutist second amendment position. So I, I agree with Nick Wright's point that people do start saying incoherent things because we have regulation in every other facet of our lives. Here's the thing though. So I saw responses like this, Jamel Hill, Mina Kimes, Joy Taylor tweeted similar kinds of things. This is being called a mass shooting. And I think we have to be more precise in our language. This is not a case of someone going into a crowd specifically with the intention of killing people. So it's not like those school shootings. I agree with Nick. I'm a parent and I got to fucking tell you every day that I drop my daughter off at school, this is in the back of my mind that something horrible like that could happen. And I'm getting around to your, to what the, what I think, I think there's a way, I'm not going to say I have the answer, but I have a suggestion that could be a way forward. But in this case, this is kids, by the way, whose faces have not been shown because in a lot of the footage of the people tackling one of the shooters, they blocked his face out. Why? Because he's not white. He's black. Did those kids obtain those guns legally through relaxation, relaxed gun regulations in the state of Missouri? Probably not. Those kids have illegal guns, right? So that's one thing. They were just, they, they were being, uh, somebody called into Chris Broussard's radio show with Rob Parker, uh, somebody who said that they were very close and saw that these kids were starting shit with grownups. Then they got into it with each other. And he's this eyewitness said they were just shooting blind. He said he wouldn't have been surprised if some of them shot each other, some, some of their own friends. So framing this as a gun control issue, when this is the looks appears to be the quintessential case of people who got guns. And I don't know this for a fact, but I'm guessing they didn't like get those guns from their parents who legally obtained them. That's misleading or, or it's, um, it's misguided. What do you think of that? Not, and I, I can continue, but I'm just curious to, to get your take so far. It gets close to my biggest gripe and why I was dreading having this conversation, especially in the guise of sports media. I have to even back up a little bit further to get to my point. I'll bring him back up on the screen. This man, Nick Wright, is a clown. He is. He is a clown. He's an absolute total clown. He is a troll and an ass. He does it for good reason. He does it because he it gets him attention. It, he does it because it gets him in the front of minds and in the back of minds of fan bases like my own. I'm a giant Bills fan and he trolls the Bills as well all the time. It's not in a, just in a really it, let me finish here. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. It's not just it's not just because he is he trolls the Bills that I call him a clown. I call him a clown because that's how he portrays himself. He portrays himself as this paragon of knowledge that this know-it-all it's part of it's a, it's a whole shtick that all these guys use all the time here's the problem with them tackling an issue like this this is not an issue that fits within the paint by numbers circumstance all this guy does, and the people who are on these shows, like Stephen A., like Dan Levitard, uh, even my boys, Tony Kornheiser and Mike Wilbon, I love them. But here's what they do. They paint by numbers daily. 
guns and gun control and violence are not issues that can be addressed by painting by numbers. So I feel for him. I feel for his family. I feel for that fan in the Chiefs uniform, even as a Bills fan who was burned by them. I feel for them. It sucks. I would hate for that to happen. You know, I don't, I didn't, I want them to lose, not to die. I get that. I, it's not something that I want to happen. But what's clear to me is that he doesn't have the chops nor the depth to handle an issue like this. Or the will. Or the will to do his, well, to do the homework. Not just will. But uh, he's he's playing a role, as I've told you repeatedly. And that role will not allow him to address deeper, more substantive issues. It's more about arguing whether LeBron James is the GOAT, whether Pat Mahomes is already better than Tom Brady, uh, uh, and, and what coach should be fired. He can't handle this. No, no. It's in him. And he would have been one of those people at the Super Bowl party I went to who, who similarly can't veer off the the um I don't want to call it ideological, but they but the track of exposure, the things they've been exposed to enough to even be able to receive dialogue on the issue that that again does not paint by numbers. The reason I interrupted you is because I was going to ask you, and I think I know the answer, but does his mean spiritedness towards fan bases bother you? A little, but that's not my big gripe. Right, right. Because like a guy like Jim Rome has been mean spirited forever. Uh, I, I, there's been plenty of guys who've been mean spirited, and and I realize you know, especially as a broadcaster, you are playing a role. You are trying to drive people to listen to you, to watch you, to to engage with you. I'm playing a role even right now. I'm a bit elevated, not crazy high, but I'm an elevated version of myself. It's part of the job. So the mean-spirited thing doesn't bug me. What bugs me is the know-it-all nature of the people on these programs, whether it is Shannon Sharp or Mad Dog Russo, who just got his extension. Uh, Stephen A, uh, Screaming A is more appropriate. Skip Bayless, all these folks, the know-it-all nature about things they can't possibly know at all, that's what bugs me. Not just about them, but about everything. And you said something... I want to laser in on the know it all nature about things they can't know at all is how I yeah. heard that. Yeah. Yeah. And you're right because these, these sports commentators have been deployed to disseminate this kind of reaction and get people tweaked emotionally. Dude, I was almost on the verge of tears listening to it just now again, because I'm sentimental, like I'm easily affected, but I also understand and I don't, I'm not going to say he's doing that on purpose, but his network knows. Here's the, the glaring and kind of disgusting irony here. Days before this happened, Matt Barnes was on the Dan Lebetard show, casually remarking that Shannon Sharp should be careful in what he said about how he's going to pull up on Mike Epps. I'm not going to go into that whole story, comedian Mike Epps, because... <laughs> They had, had words, and Mike Epps said, listen, the All-Star game is in Indianapolis. That's my hometown. You pull up on me. I don't fight. The insinuation was, I got I got boys there that'll shoot you. Matt Barnes gets on the Dan Lebitard show. Dan Lebitard, I will say, is a fucking performer who I think cynically plays into exactly what you're talking about. He did not challenge Matt Barnes like... Matt Barnes was almost smirking and I don't want to paint it too, in too bad of a light, but it's like, there's so much of this. Oh yeah. You better, you better be, you should be cautious about what you say. And it's like, yo, would Shannon Sharp get shot? 
Shannon Sharp wasn't saying he was going to pull up and like fucking beat the guy up. He's just going to say, I'm pulling up to confront you on what you said. Let's talk it. You know, that the fact that Lebetard wouldn't challenge that, but then would perform all this outrage about this when those two things are fucking related, the casualness with which black youth are exposed to this idea. Oh, well, you know, you roll up on me. I'm going to solve this with a gun. And, and I don't want to go too hard on someone like Matt Barnes. It's like, yo, do y'all understand the influence you have? But I just, I think there's a real double standard there. And after, what's funny is after Matt Barnes did that, I almost recorded a video and I was like, well, do I want to really w- g- stick my fucking nose in this and get all the, you know, hassle from it. And then this happens. It's like, this is a direct result of the culture of black young men being exposed to violence like it's nothing, I think. And then maybe that sounds like a pandering thing to say. Part of it. I I think it's also the result of I I think it's very uh, uh, the easy analog is what's going on down at the border, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, let everybody in, or don't let anybody in. Build a wall, or don't let it, or let everybody in. Have a sanctuary city, and uh, uh, you can come here. Okay, it's really easy to talk about in either platitude. We should just lock, seal off the country, and not let people in unless we we want them. Or we should just let everybody in because sealing off the, the the country is wrong. You can go either way. There's plenty of YouTube uh, in, in online conversations in, in either direction. And lots of grandstanding, like what you're saying about Nick, right? There's lots of grandstanding, what you're describing on that issue on either side. Yeah, but it doesn't, neither one deals with the issue. The issue uh, uh, is is multi-layered. The issue is that you had a bunch of people, not just people from Mexico. You know, you look at the reports, you have people from South America, from Latin America, people from Russia, people from Africa are coming through the border and they're just flooding in. And that, and uh, we have a group of of politicians who've decided that, hey, we're going to make everybody a a place, a sanctuary city when it was two or three or four people, but they didn't realize that, hey, maybe someday it'll be thousands. And there's consequences for that. And as long as it's happening down there and it's not happening to me, it's okay. And they're like, they're like, no, it can't happen here. Let's send them over there. But even, even all those things don't deal with the actual issue. The actual issue is we have to figure out how to how we're going to manage immigration in this country, which Democrats and Republicans have passed on for generation after generation after generation. Neither one wants to deal with the actual issue. The actual issue is that we don't have a sensible, thoughtful way to go about immigrating in this country. I have friends that have immigrated that, that have gone through the process. They've come here. And it's taken nearly a decade just to get everything in line. And they're in limbo for that time. That doesn't make any sense. It also doesn't make any sense to just let everybody walk in who wants to. You have to figure out what that middle ground is and build toward it. It's a similar thing on the gun tip. It's, look, like it or lump it, it's in our constitution. Yes, things have been removed from our constitution, including slavery. But, well, you, you think that's it's actually possible to remove it? Okay. No, I think the resistance to this would be even more fierce than than that. That's my guess. I don't know, more f- fierce, but I think that might be a, a bit of an exaggeration. But, but I think it would be fierce, without a doubt. I don't think it would be like, I, I don't think there would be a straight up, I don't think we'll have a war. I don't think so. Um, some people say we would, but I don't think, I don't think it would get that far. Just my, just my guess. But, okay, odds are you're not going to be able to properly remove it from the Constitution. Therefore, we have a right to bear arms. 
okay, there's a big stretch between, you know, as uh, uh, no guns and guns. Okay, we know that we're going to have some guns. Okay, let's figure out which guns and how we're going to do it. It's not about getting rid of them all. It's about figuring out how we actually make a system that works and how um, and making it universal, which is which is another problem. Huge. These are la- these are uh, you like much like with sports, and and part of me really really wants to get into the sports game because I don't see these guys and these people who address sports. They're not talking about fundamental stuff. They are talking about just the very top layer emotional stuff that'll get people engaged. They're not well, talking about the structural stuff that you have to work your way through to actually solve the issues. Like what you have brought up before about not enough black head coaches in the NFL. You, yeah. You've talked about how that story is not, people are not talking about. Um, they're talking about surface level storylines that they invent. <laughs> they're not even getting past that. Amen. They're frosting the cake and then filming themselves and then talking about the frosting on the cake. Amen. It has nothing to do with the actual fucking cake itself. There's very little analysis of the sport. (laughs) So when a guy like Nick Reich decides that, hey, I'm going to spend seven, eight minutes breaking down this really tragic situation that I observed... And I believe he's from Kansas City or in that area? Yes, yes. Yeah, in my hometown, this terrible thing happened. I cried and this was awful. And I'm I'm afraid for my children like you are. You know, full disclosure, not a parent. I I don't have that experience. At least not yet. What? When you're not, it, it just comes off hollow. Sanctimonious. And it's the kind of thing that happens across uh it well, you know what's the it, this is sports media, but you know what's a what uh it's kind of like when you watch uh if you ever watch the Today Show have to talk about sports. <laughs> when Elmo's not getting strangled on there. <laughs> yeah, like it's like <laughs> but but you know you, you ever like have them like try to have like someone who's not a sports person but they're excited about a thing and they have to talk about it talk anchors about it. don't not don't a- local anchors have to do this a lot and it sounds kind of hokey and stilted is that what you're uh, getting uh, at a little bit but i'm not talking about local anchors i'm talking a, a specific thing that i've seen on a lot of network television so i'm not familiar of- with it what are you saying like there? Cable TV, where where it's like, oh yeah, our network has the rights to the NFL. So we have to talk to this football person. <laughs> and I I have no no interaction with football. I got no background with football, but I have to talk football with this person. And I and you get this sort of awkward, you know, impassioned and try to, you know, like uh uh interaction but you don't get anything substantive no no and it sounds like someone's mom who doesn't know football talking about it very much so it's very awkward like if like if a mom were talking to her football player son's friends just to try to relate in that how stilted that would sound Mm -hmm. you know so this is one of the reasons why i when we have events like this overlap with sports in particular. It just drives me batty. It makes me not want to go near it because these guys, these women, they don't, their format is not made to handle that kind of things. Very no, they few- didn't. But theirs especially are not. They didn't build their audience that way. And on the other side, I thought Jason Whitlock's tweet was equally reprehensible and simplistic and reductive. He's like, uh, he re- replied to somebody else who said, you know, real men or something. I- I'm I'm paraphrasing, but uh, 
aren't willing to sacrifice freedom for safety, which is a, which yeah. is a totally fucking one dimensional. I'm sure Clay Travis hasn't handled this sure. with any more sophistication than Nick Wright has. He's just stumping for his overlords what they want him to say. Look, his I, constituents. Look, I, I find Whitlock more interesting than Nick Wright or Clay Travis for a bunch of reasons. But at his core, he is also a clown. <laughs> he is um he is he he is um heightening his thoughts, his ideas. He's blowing them up and he is speaking often extemporaneously for hours at a time. And he's he's rarely doing something that's actually constructive. Mm -hmm. Rarely, yes, yes. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a wrestler. He's a he's a wrestling villain. Yeah, yeah. Like he's 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 pro wrestling. Like and I mean, I, yeah. And I thought that that point sucked. I thought it was like so not getting into what the the complexity of the issue. Now. There is something that occurred to me, and I mean, if you're up for it, I can bounce it off you to see what yeah, your yeah, go ahead. reaction is. So much as you're getting at the the impasse around guns and, and a bunch of other issues as well is so stark that it seems impossible. I mean, it seems like the the political will to try to have anything resembling a solution is not happening. So here's my suggestion. Could we take the side door? Because I think as someone who's come around on guns, progressives who are mostly against or almost, you know, universally against guns, what they have to understand is that, you know, wanting the state to take care of you and trusting the state to take care of you all the time and to have your best interests at heart is just not a practical way to, to live. Um, Interestingly enough, my old boss at the recording studio, he is a staunch Democrat who is also staunchly NRA. And he says he gets shit from both uh, for, for that. But um, I wonder, my solution is three-tiered. Number one, what if everybody in the country joined the NRA? Then the conversation would move would could move. I don't know what their lobbying like sort of mission as an organization is. I don't know if they would even want that. I don't know if they prefer to have a, a, a more sort of predictable demographic be on board. But what if like, actually, what if it was, if we, we were, if it just came with citizenship, you're a member of the NRA, then what? So that's one thing. My friend Pete, the professor in North Carolina, said that Glenn Beck said the same thing. I haven't heard his, his clip. Two, what if youth were all trained on guns, be all of them, before they were 18? Now, what this creates then is that means you're going to have a bunch of kids who are better at killing people. That's going to be a side. You're not going to limit the SSRI um, reuptake inhibitor people that zone out and they get depersonalized and go into a place and shoot, you know, 50 people not feeling like they're in their body. You're not going to eliminate that with this solution. But what you will do is potentially mitigate a lot of the youth culture chaos, like what we're seeing here with Kia boys, because kids want, particularly male kids. They want to be useful. The reason somebody's in a gang and willing to kill somebody else is because they just want something to follow and devote themselves to. You can say they're all fucked up in the head and all blah, blah, blah. And the internet has got them all whacked. But if you expose kids to the culture and the precision and the discipline and the adult interaction that it requires to learn how to use a firearm properly... I do think a lot of this type of shit that we saw at the Super Bowl parade could significantly be reduced. It's a fucking long shot, but it's something 
worth considering. The last thing is I heard Sarah Hader talk, men, suggest this to Megan Dom on their podcast, uh, Special Place in Hell. She was like, I, I definitely think we need some sort of mandatory military service for young people like we have, like they do in Israel, because this country is so divided. You need to sort of bring people together and just expose themselves to people not like them. You could fold this into that, like right after high school, before high school and college, you go do a year in the military, you get a fucking, you get trained in how to operate firearms. I think it would alleviate a lot of the, the youth kind of just going crazy issue. That's my proposal. There's a lot of roadblocks to it. I don't think it's a magic bullet, to, to pardon the term, um, but it's something. What do you think? I think part two is the most interesting of the bunch. Mm. There's an argument that I could make. That part of the problem is with guns is that we've made them special. We have made them, um, and, you know, some, you could argue, rightfully so. It is, they're not, you know, toys. But we, we treat them as this thing that you can obtain to, uh, to, to reach power and status. Um, to, you know, not everybody, but, you know, I could certainly see that if you're a kid, let's say a kid grew up in a neighborhood, not like, not unlike the ones I did, where you're seeing violence. You're seeing people get beat up and you see guns. You see big, tall, strong people with guns. And it's like, wow, this, this person has a gun and they can, they can act with impunity. They can do whatever they want. They don't have to go to school. They don't have to, you know, go to work the way I work. No, they... They are. They get to do pretty much whatever they want, using that kind of prism. Obtaining one of these and using this as a as a way to solve your disputes, as a, as as I've, you know, gathered from this incident that this is essentially would it started with just a, a dispute wasn't a, an act of terrorism so much it was, a, right. it, was, it was someone being awful and opening fire if we could disconnect the two and say hey this is a thing that's you know that's baked into the structure of this country it's baked into our our our, our law and you know this is something that that you should learn the, what the 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 consequences of this. You should learn the power of this. That's interesting. Lean into it is what I'm saying. Yeah. That's what other choice do we have? Yeah, I think that's that's certainly a, a, where I am going as I think through your three options. That we're not. Unless we're going to just throw out the Constitution, which I am not in a hurry to do. And it's also not what's, going anywhere. Right. And what's going to be the reaction to that, man? You're going to have these people that like are like really dug in on this. It's, it's not going to be pretty. And then you're going to have state governments fighting it as what Nick Wright was talking about there. Sure. I mean, why not go the other way? And here's the thing. This issue is almost impossible to talk about in a way that both left and right can actually see their shared interests. So take a side approach that makes it so that you're kind of playing into both of their values a little bit. Um, you're saying to... Uh, obviously, people, gun culture people are going to appreciate this. Like they want, you know... I would hope, right? Like we're saying, we're stepping, we're going to train all your kids on how to use guns. I would think gun culture people or pro-gun people would, would appreciate that. 
maybe not, but but I would think. And for people, um, for people on the other side of it, it's like you're completely removed from this object. Like you said, it's almost like a, like a forbidden fruit or something. Mm -hmm. Right. Why don't you see what it's like to actually handle one yourself? And why don't you get involved so that you become part of the constituency that can shape policy or have a say in policy instead of just bashing your head against these people that are not hearing you. And I, I want to also address your third suggestion, because I've had a similar thought, not because of this, but broadly about military service. And the fact that we are in constant war over the last 30 years, especially right. going back further, pretty much, but 30 years, pretty solid with conflict after conflict after conflict. And if you, uh, I believe it was, um, uh, we went through not just, I think it was from the Obama administration, I, 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 someone, I recall reading that, that, um, there wasn't a day where we weren't bombing anybody, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? Right. I mean, would you say that in, in the pop culture sense, we've been in constant war in terms of like the public's awareness since the 91 Super Bowl? Sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so, uh, going into uh, Kuwait. Yeah, sounds about right. So, as I think through these issues, I think that one of the reasons why we are not, we are more willing to to get involved with these foreign entanglements is because it's not our kid. Because we don't have a draft. Mm -hmm. Because it is so easy to avoid military service. And I, I did. I considered it. But I, I, you know, I graduated from high school the, uh, the year, well, I was a senior when 9-11 happened. And I was talking to recruits throughout my senior year, even after I got into Niagara. Um, the best argument that, that this recruiter had for me, and one that I, I really thought about a lot, was he said, hey, I'm from Huntsville, uh, Alabama. And he picked me up from, um, from the house and said, um, I did it to get the hell away from Huntsville, Alabama. I got my education. I got to see the world. I got to go places that I never thought I could, that my brothers and sisters didn't get to go. And learn things that they couldn't possibly, you know, think was possible. You know, and uh, I look at you and I, I see a guy who wants to escape. Mm. And that was true. I wanted to get the hell out of Dodge. I did not for a very long time, but I did for a while. That's how I ended up at my college. What we have done by getting rid of the draft is relying on largely a very poor population to staff our military. And what has happened with our government is that we are just throwing them around the world. Cannon fodder. And if it was everybody sharing it, much like what's starting to happen with immigration, where you now we have both the South, Southern states, and states all across the union are all sharing the impact of this. I think we'd be a lot less likely to get in the war and the backlash, the fight would be a lot more intense mm. because it's not just a small percentage of the population that's going to come back in coffins. Mm -hmm. It's the rich man's kid 
in kids that grew up like me. That's how I got to your argument. I think it's a fair argument, you know, as a uniting force, but I think it's a similar thought. Yeah, yeah. And I also think it would give people a lot of vocational training right out of high school. You mm -hmm. get skills there, including, yes, including how to handle a gun. My Lyft driver yesterday was is a, a Hispanic lady, former Marine, who told me she takes her grants or retired Marine who takes her grandson camping and shows him how to use a gun. And she says she's very disciplined about it. He's only allowed at certain times when they're shooting in specific cases it's you know so i think getting over this fear because they're not going anywhere even if you change the laws tomorrow there's more guns than people and i don't like that i don't i don't love guns but i think they are a necessary evil or a necessary fact of life i mean you 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 can't exist in a world where other people have them and you don't <laughs> Or you're just existing on a prayer. And the other thing, to, you know, you you talked about these kids. You know, you said what they did was horrible. I mean, it's stupid. It's more. It's like I could see a fucking teenage boy doing shit like that and not grasping the consequences because teenage boys are dumb and do idiotic things without structure to catch them. And if you have them train, again, some of them are going to be better marksmen and kill people easier. But would we see an overall reduction in this? Right? It, would, the, would the rage and isolation and resentment that feeds into mass shootings, could that be mitigated by giving some people a place to belong where they have interaction with other youth and grownups? I'd hope so. What I mean, what other fucking what else is on the table that what other choice do we have? So um yeah, you mentioned oddly enough, I can I flirted with the idea of of joining the military, but I don't think I ever seriously considered it. But I do think something out of high school for a year would have been great for me. Would have mm -hmm. really worked wonders on my ability to function. Uh and what's funny is um me and my friends in the Bronx, like they liked to uh, to lead recruiters on. They would go to their office on purpose just to fuck with them and yeah. get them thinking they were interested. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can certainly see why. I mean, it, it is uh, like a, a, like a, some of them were, were pretty jerky, but the guy I talked to was not. If you are watching somewhere out there, sir. Do you remember the Beavis and Butthead no. episode where they went to the recruiter's office and they walked in and he leaned back behind his desk and he had different VHS tapes to show to the different people. And so one of them said minorities, gays, and then one of them, <laughs> and then one of them said no future. And he pulled that one out to show them. You know, that would not surprise me. It's, it's, um, um, <laughs> You know, uh, uh, it reminds me of, of uh, certain car dealerships. They uh, they look for uh, a diversity, uh, uh, a poo poo platter of staffers, and they deploy them based on who walks in. And uh, you know, it is logical, right? Sure. Uh, that guy I talked to from Alabama, he was a black guy. So, you know, I think I think that was probably for a reason. I'm sure sometimes it backfires where you mismatch somebody because you misgauge the surface features. But but yes, yes, sure. 